Well, welcome back. You're watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's our Mindset Monday edition, and it's time for our very first hot topic. And today we'll be taking a look at World Press Freedom Day. Our guest is Nick Agule, public affairs analyst resident in the UK. Hello, Nick. Good morning, and uh, good morning to our viewers. Good morning. You're welcome, Nick. Uh, How is King Charles III? <laughs> King Charles III is uh, already two days into his official coronation, and uh, yesterday they had a mega party, a mega musical concert at which uh, our own uh, Tiwa Savage uh, also performed. So uh, uh, today is uh, is a public holiday in the UK. Uh, they call it a bank holiday. So today is a bank holiday here to celebrate the coronation. So a lot of uh, communities had street parties yesterday. Uh, today will be a day of uh, rest and for others going out visiting as part of the coronation. So yes, it's going well. And Nigeria Stiwa Savage represented us wearing that beautiful green colored dress. And, and singing and in Yoruba as well. Exactly. Yeah. Making a statement, I yeah. think. Making a strong I'm statement. I'm sorry. She, she performed excellently well. Mm -hmm. I, loved, I loved the mixture of the, the music she brought on board. She is well talented. Yeah. I mean, the Nigeria is, is full of uh, talent. There's so much abundance of talent, be it in sports, be it in music. Uh, be it in uh, literature, uh, we, we just need to unlock these things for, for the world to, to see how much God has blessed us. All right, let's go back to our main hot topic, which is the World Press Freedom Day. It's 30 years since the United Nations designated May 3rd World Press Freedom Day. And before we go into looking at the state of press freedom around the world, let's start with Nigeria. Charity begins at home. Nigeria has been ranked 123rd out of 180. That's for 2023 when it comes to press freedom day, uh, well, uh, press freedom in the country. How do you respond to this? To be honest, I, I really think that that ranking is generous uh, because if we see what's been happening in recent times when the Nigerian Broadcasting Commission uh, will just um, charge, uh, prosecute, convict, and fine brokers' organizations or media houses without even giving them room to defend themselves. You, you realize that um, the media in Nigeria is not as free as we would have wanted it to be. I mean, granted that we've made progress. I, I, I know that uh, in the days of the military junta, it was possible that even as I am on this live TV uh, now, uh, there will be certain things that I will say or will be discussed and uh, security operatives can actually come and surround uh, Plus TV uh, and be ready to pick me up. Uh, that was what we used to see during the, the military junta days. Mm -hmm. So that now is not there. Uh, we have uh, uh, a liberalization that took place in the in the media world because before before now uh, newspapers radio stations tv stations were all owned by the government and so it came to a point where um, this was liberalized uh, making it possible for the private sector to come in and own media houses uh, and now the the kind of things that we witnessed during the military era are also not happening but we are not there. We are not yet there. Given the activities of the Nigerian Broadcast, uh, Broadcasting Commission, given the activities of uh, the present minister uh, for information, uh, you can see that there is a lot of intolerance uh, that is existing within the government circles. Uh, they don't want to hear alternative views. Alternative views are taken to be attacks on the government. And so, there is still work to be done. There is still room to allow the press to 
actually carry out their duties, perform their functions as the fourth state of the realm in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Now, according to Reporters Without Borders, that's the media watchdog, Nigeria is the worst one of the worst and most difficult countries in West Africa for the press. And that's despite the fact that Section 22 of the 1999 Constitution as amended, you know, um, empowers the media to hold government accountable to the people without any encumbrance. What does that say about our practice and of, you know, of, 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 of democracy in this part of the world and the respect that we have for our Constitution? Yes. The, the report, to me, is a wake-up call to us that we need to improve. We need to improve because um, Nigeria, Nigeria's democracy will not develop if we don't allow the press to do their work. You see, um, I tell people that this current situation where our young people uh, are jackpying from Nigeria to go elsewhere. They are actually not jackpying to leave Nigeria and go and be recipients of uh, uh, qualitative education, good health care, 24-7 uh, electricity, good road security, and all of that. That is not what they are actually going to get. What they are going to get is a democracy that has been allowed to work. And if our own democracy is also allowed to work, we will get these things that our young people are running to go and get in foreign lands, in Nigeria, and even much more, you know. So democracy will only thrive if there is freedom of the press. And if there is freedom of expression, even by the citizens. Because, you see, even here in the United Kingdom, where I am, you will discover that the democracy is participatory. The, the, the politicians seek for votes from the citizens, and they make promises to the citizens when they are seeking for those votes. And when the citizens give them the votes, and they become elected, and they come into government, the citizens accompany the politicians through the governance process. You know, the citizens are voicing out either by writing letters to their MPs, writing uh, to their councillors, writing to ministers in government, writing to the prime minister himself. The people are demonstrating on the streets. There is no day that you're not going to have uh, um, uh, people who are protesting in Parliament Square, which is the seat of government. And the press is allowed to do its work. The press, in fact, yesterday I was watching the BBC, which is the government-owned television station, here with my wife. Mm -hmm. And the BBC, after talking about the coronation and all of that, they now started to talk about how the police arrested those who wanted to go and uh, carry placards and demonstrate against the king because they are not members of the king. And they allowed the, the people, uh, the, the, the Republicans, those who are protesting, to come on BBC and lay their point. And I, and I told my wife that this is going to be impossible for NTA to do in Nigeria. For NTA to give this kind of freedom to people who are protesting against the government to come on, on, on live and be making their points. So this is, these are the situations that... If we don't put politicians' feet to the fire, there's no way they are going to deliver good governance. I tell people that if Joe Biden today or uh, Sunak here in the UK believe that they can do something and get away with it, they can do it. As leaders, they can do it. The only reason that they fear to do it is because of the repercussions. And those repercussions are led by the press. When a minister does, in fact, not even a minister, prime ministers have been taken down here in the UK, even in recent times, including uh, uh, Liz Truss, including uh, Boris Johnson. They have been taken down by the press because the press are the ones that lead the protest and the people follow. 
And the prime ministers know that, look, if I don't go down, then my party is going to go down with me. This is what develops democracy. This is what makes democracy. The democracy thrives on pillars, on certain pillars. And when those pillars are not there, no matter how we try, we're not going to get it right. And of course, one of the pillars is press freedom. Then one of the pillars is uh, freedom of expression by citizens, just like uh, electorals, the sanctity of the electoral law, an independent judiciary, an independent legislature, are the pillars that make democracy to, to thrive. If we don't have them in Nigeria, then our hope that we are going to develop will always remain a pipe dream. Well, um, seven journalists have been killed this year. And um, in 2022, 55 journalists and four media workers were killed. 568 journalists and media workers are currently in prison. This is a very harsh terrain for workers, journalists, media people. In Nigeria here, the Nigerian Press Organization recently inaugurated the National Media Complaints Commission. How far do you think they can go with this ombudsman that they have set up in the wake of this hostility against media practitioners in Nigeria? I think it's a good development to have the ombudsman, but uh, when I look at the, 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 the setup, the ombudsman comes after uh, an event where press freedom is abused, happens. Which is okay, but that is that is uh, reactive. I think that there has to be efforts to be proactive, meaning to stop the abuse of fre of of, uh, of a press freedom in the first place, and that is what the incoming government have to set up. The incoming government should should stop this intolerance for opposing views in Nigeria. They should give us a fresh, uh, a, a breath of fresh air, because it is when we give room for everybody to have their voice, including the press, including the citizens, that our democracy is going to to be, to, to strengthen. So we we should we should be more on the on the prevention of the abuse of of, of press freedom. So in Nigeria. Um, we, we, should, we should be intolerant. We should be intolerant of those who come against journalists for doing their jobs. So I, I expect the, the, the incoming government at all levels to say, look, so long as the press are doing their job without running against or abusing the rights of another person, let us allow them to do their job. Let them and and, and the and the president elect himself is, is a media house owner, so he should he should know this thing. He shouldn't come to the seat of government and then uh, begin to uh, take take out the same organization for which he is a participant as as an owner. So if we have this kind of situation where we we say it is okay. To have an opposing view, it is okay if we are, if there is constructive criticism. It's okay if um, a, a government media house even gives room to an opposition to make their point. Then the 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 the, the, the number of cases of journalists being arrested or journalists are being harassed or even uh, journalists being arrested, detained or even uh, paying the supreme price because they want to inform Nigerians will not arise again. But if the situation still arises, then the ombudsman approach, which they have set up now, is also good. But then what will happen to decisions by the ombudsman? If the decision by the ombudsman are not being respected, then we're back to square one. So the government has to make a commitment that they are going to respect the decisions of the ombudsman. And that is the only way we can make uh, a way forward.
Everything is what a lot of people say is lacking here. And you just said that the president-elect is an owner of a media house. Well, maybe after the declaration of assets that we have been asked to declare, we will find that uh, specifically as him being the owner of any media house. Because as at this moment, I'm not sure he owns up to that, uh, accepting the fact that he owns a media house that we think he owns. Uh, but that's uh, aside. Um, when we're talking about the press, uh, a lot of people want to define press as the mainstream media, you know. And so many people will argue that press nowadays is more embracing. And in fact, because of that, you cannot separate it from uh, freedom of speech for individuals who may not even be journalists. What would be your definition of press, this press that needs to have freedom? Does it include the social media, or it has to just strictly remain with the main, mainstream media? The, the, the freedom of the press should be equally applicable to the conventional or mainstream media and the new media, which is the social media. So. Everybody should be allowed to have uh, a freedom of expression. The only thing is that people have to understand that your freedom stops when somebody else's freedom or rights are being infringed. So the fact that uh, you have access to social media, you are on WhatsApp or Twitter or Facebook, and you can just make unsubstantiated uh, allegations or cast as passions or actually uh, uh, say anything that you can be heard uh, to account then 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 that 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 is for you you know people have to be responsible especially on the on the social media aspect you know don't propagate a a, a story that you have not verified don't write don't originate a story that you have framed in your head, as many people are doing this these, these days. Otherwise, uh, already we have laws against defamation. Uh, we have seen people being sued. You can be sued for defamation. So that is an advice that we have to give to those who are using the new media, that you need to be responsible. You know, we have seen cases where uh, new media like uh, Twitter has actually uh, come to very good use. Uh, we saw the case of uh, the NSAS protest it was basically mobilized on um, on the new media, which is uh, Twitter, and see the success that it brought uh, up until uh, miscreants uh, took over. Uh, I mean, possibly uh, sponsored by 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 those who wanted the NSAS protest to to be disrupted. So, if the the or everybody should be free to say their mind in a responsible way that it will not infringe on the rights and freedoms of others. So this should be applicable to both media. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, I'm just uh, sorry, Maureen. I'm just concerned about where we draw the line between this freedom and uh, what you're saying as taking, abusing the freedom. Now, let me give you an instance of what really confused me at some point. There's an African president that went to a public function. He took the salute, and then he peed on, him, on himself. And this story was carried, and a lot of people were ad arrested. Reason that the president was being insulted. And in so many countries, there are laws that you should never insult the president. You should never talk bad about the president, no matter what. But this thing is something that people could see. And the story was ca carried. It constituted an embarrassment for the president, and people were arrested. So you are between the devil and the blue sea, trying to report something that is true, but which someone somewhere is judging as being embarrassing to someone in office. So how can we marry the two? How can we balance the two when the truth can be defined as an embarrassment? What do we do? My, my view is that what happened in that African country is tyranny. 
Yes. It started only because people were reporting an actual event in the way it happened. You know, so I, I, I don't see anything that is wrong with that. You know, if, um, if a president has suffered a, a, a mishap uh, of uh, uh, maybe it was out of uh, a medical condition or whatever, people, it, it is right for it to be reported. Listen, we don't understand that these leaders that we have are like pilots on a plane that we all have boarded and is airborne. How are we not going to be interested in the condition and well-being of the pilot? It will only be at your peri for you not to be interested. If the president didn't want to come into the public space, he shouldn't have sought the votes of the citizens to become a public figure. He should have just remained in his house. If he's in his house, and he peed on himself in his house. Who will even bother that he has peed on himself? Even if somebody goes to put it on, on the news, for instance, if somebody goes to put it on the news now that Nikagule peed on his house, it's not going to trend because Nikagule is not a public uh, figure. He's not, he's not a public servant. He's a private citizen and an unknown quantity. So people have to understand that once you surrender your, or rather, once you step forward to seek the people's vote and become their leader at any level, you have surrendered your privacy. You have surrendered your privacy because the, the people you are leading have to be interested in what is happening to you. It's only in Nigeria that you, or, or, or elsewhere in Africa, like you are saying, that a president or governor or so will take ill and he's being shielded away from the citizens that this person is leading. As we see in other democracies, when presidents are sick, the public is told exactly that they are sick. In the UK here, uh, Boris Johnson nearly died of COVID. And all through the time Boris Johnson got COVID, the citizens were being put at breast what was happening. Even when Boris Johnson was put on life support, because they had to, to put him to sleep. They put him into an induced coma. Because if they didn't put him into that induced coma, COVID would have defeated him. So they just put him to sleep as if he was dead. So that his body will shut down and COVID will not be able to, to switch off his life. All that was being put out in the press and we were seeing his pictures on his hospital bed. So that country needs to wake up to the realities of the modern times, that whatever happens to leaders, people need to know about it. So long as people are actually saying exactly what happened to the leader, so long as what they are saying is the truth. So I say that 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 that, that, that was an act of tyranny, and uh, we also see it in Nigeria. These are the things that need to change. Okay, uh, well, Nikagule, thank you so much for uh, giving you, us your perspective and insight to this celebration of World uh, Press Freedom Day. We do hope that things will get better for the press and for people who break the stories and give the stories as they are. Thank you so much for being a part of the show this morning. Thank you, and a nice day to you and to our viewers. Thank you. Okay, that was Nick Agule, a public affairs analyst, talking to us from the UK. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll be looking at a second hot topic. This time, it's on mental health. Stay with us.